Welcome back to Raised by Giants live discussion. Welcome everyone in the chat. Good to see you guys and any moderators or channel members out there. A reminder that Super Chats and Super Stickers are available and are a great way to help support the show and get any of your questions answered. If you send in a Super Chat with a question for me or for my guest, I will 100% make sure that that question gets answered. Writer Ranger channel memberships are also available and are a great way to help support the show monthly and for as much as a cup of coffee per month. A new channel members only episode will be dropping tomorrow about government remote viewing programs. You're not going to want to miss that one. And if you're already a channel member, it should pop up in your feed. But if it doesn't, check the community tab page on the channel. So this evening we have an amazing show for you guys with author, filmmaker, and writer, producer, and star of our hit documentary, JFK X, Solving the Crime of the Century, on Amazon Prime now. The links are in the description. Jay Widener, welcome back to the show. How's it going? It's going good. How are you? Doing great, and I'm excited to jump into this topic with you because, man, have we got a lot of good documentaries that's come out here recently. Netflix is really just blowing the lid off of a lot of things. And what we're really going to be discussing here this evening is this uh, new documentary called American Conspiracy, The Octopus Murders. And when I first saw this pop up on Netflix, I asked a few of my friends, I was like, hey, what do you guys know about this? And one of them said, oh, it's got something to do with UFOs. And I was like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't have anything to do with UFOs. And I was like, yeah, and then I watched it and, and they didn't really talk anything about UFOs in it. And then I contacted you and I'm like, hey, we got to, uh, what do you know about this? And then you gave me a whole story and how you were uh, pretty much involved with this whole case when it happened. So first off, what did you think about the uh, documentary? Uh, I thought it was really good. Um, you know, they, it wasn't as comprehensive as I wished it would be, but I don't know whose fault that is. I know Netflix likes to keep things tight. So they were probably under some kind of restrictions to keep things in some kind of order. And they didn't retract themselves like they did with the Son of Sam documentary where we spent the first three episodes getting all the copious, delicious facts. And then on the fourth episode, they said, ah, none of that's true and threw it all out. So, you know, that, that kind of Netflix BS really pisses me off and they didn't do it. So I was really happy that they didn't like suddenly say at the very end, oh, well, you know, Danny Castellaro probably killed himself. And then the whole rest of this is just BS. And they didn't. So it was a good documentary. And the guy, you know, the, the guy, the lead investigator, I mean, you know, spent 10 years looking into that. And um, so the way I got involved, and actually I got involved in all of this uh, uh, because of Danny Castellaro, who was murdered in 1991, I believe May of 1991. And um, what happened with me was I was living out on Bainbridge Island in the Puget Sound. And um, one night I woke up with a nightmare. I don't usually have nightmares, but this was a whopper. And in this dream, I was in a kind of a hotel room and there was this guy with kind of long blondish hair and he was completely naked and his whole arm, both arms were just bleeding down onto the ground. And the ground was just filling up with blood. And then he looked up and there was like anguish in his eyes. And he said, man, you have to help me. And then I woke up and I was completely flipped out. And uh, then I got on the ferry to go do a job the next day. And I always bought the Seattle Times when I would take the ferry ride, the 40 minute ferry ride. And in those days, I wouldn't do it now. And there on like page four was the guy I saw in my dream. And it was an article about how this investigative journalist named Danny Castellaro had committed suicide in a West Virginia motel room. And it flipped me out. I completely flipped out. And <clears throat> literally within months, I'd started my radio show on KCMU FM, Mind Over Matters was the name of the show, uh, which I started covering all of this stuff. Um, I got deeply involved in a bunch of uh, different things. And I was at the peripheral of the octopus Danny Casolero murder. Um, I did talk to uh, the guy who's featured heavily in that documentary, Michael Riconosciuto, by phone 
from the Pierce County Jail where he was serving time for meth, I think, making meth, um, which I didn't believe because he was too smart. Uh, to, to be do doing something stupid like that. He was clearly a very intelligent guy. I, you know, I knew how to program assembly and basic. And um, I talked to him and he definitely knew how to program really well. He knew all the right terms that only a, a really good programmer would know. And I, I was left with this idea that what he said he did, he did that he had the talent to actually do what he said he did. And what did he say he did? What he said he did was that he took the software called Promise and wrote a back door into it for the CIA. And, um, and that was why I called him. And I, you know, and so I, I questioned him to find out if, if he was a BS artist and like all people that work in intelligence, you know, a lot of stuff he says is just thrown in there to confuse you. So you have to be really careful. It's a very um, difficult path to navigate through the wilderness when you're dealing with these guys. But, you know, I, I did know enough about programming to know that he was a really, very good programmer. And so I came away believing that um, that part of what he said was true. And, um, and he served, I believe, like 20 years. I think he just got out recently. Uh, they show him getting out in the documentary. And Michael, if you're out there, you know, I'm glad you're free. Um, but what's really interesting about this whole octopus thing is it actually links to JFKX, believe it or not. And um, that's why I, I'm so intrigued by it. So as we've been talking in, you know, in several episodes about the, these intel wars, uh, that actually started with the election of John F. Kennedy. Um, as I, I'm just going to really repeat this real fast because I want to get to the real meat of this. But basically, the CIA took over the intelligence uh, of the United States in 1947, usurping the Office of Naval Intelligence, which had been, which had been the number one intelligence agency. And they didn't take it very well. That's why the um, CIA's first director was an admiral. They were trying to assuage the Navy from being angry. And um, so 13 years later, after the, uh, the Eisenhower uh, administration was ending, the ONI really wanted to find out what was going on in the CIA. Um, the CIA was requesting all sorts of very secretive documents from them. They didn't want to give up. And they, didn't, they were in a quandary. And so they put two candidates up for election in 1960. Richard Nixon was Office of Naval Intelligence and John F. Kennedy was Office of Naval Intelligence. They did this to ensure that they wouldn't lose. And uh, that's why Nixon didn't complain when Kennedy obviously stole the Chicago election from Nixon. Everyone wondered why Nixon just went, oh, OK, well, see you next time, because that was a, the operation was to get somebody in there. It wasn't to win the election. It was to get somebody from the Office of Naval Intelligence into the presidency to find out what the hell was going on. So Kennedy gets in there. Of course, we know what happens. He, he, he and Bobby uncover all their stuff. And then his life is threatened. And then the Office of Naval Intelligence you know, goes in and rescues their agent, um, as, it, as they should do, and if his life and his family's life was under duress. <clears throat> and so we start beginning this weird succession of, of presidents that are either Office of Naval Intelligence or their CIA. So Johnson was clearly in with the CIA and the military industrial complex. And then they elected Nixon. Nixon was again Office of Naval Intelligence. And you'll notice that the Office of Naval Intelligence presidents I'm going to show you never last very long in office. They only lasted three years. Nixon got reelected, the only one that got reelected. And he only lasted five years because they threw him out on Watergate, which is a complete CIA operation. So uh, Nixon and, oh, and the other thing that unites them is they don't start wars. They're the only people in, that I'm going to list out here that don't start any wars. So Kennedy didn't start a war. Nixon got us out of Vietnam and didn't start a war. Then the next president was uh, Ford, and he was CIA. He was in the Warren Commission. Then the next one was Jimmy Carter, who was definitely ONI. He was officially Office of Naval Intelligence. He, of course, put Stansfield Turner in, who was in Navy, uh, pissing the CIA off. And here's where Casolero and the octopus comes in. So... Um, 
Stansfield Turner does a complete evaluation of the CIA and he finds all sorts of bad, bad people in there. And he makes a list. And by the way, those guys in the octopus film, they show a list of all the people they think are in the octopus <laughs> kind of on the side. It's every one of those people. Every one of those people that's on that list in that documentary is the people that I'm about to talk about. So Stansfield Turner on Halloween night, 1978, he did what in the intelligence community is called the Halloween night massacre. He fired, we don't know the exact number, somewhere between two to 300 CIA agents and sent them into complete and utter oblivion. We thought, we thought, but what happened is, is that a certain ex-president who lived in Texas uh, who had been the head of the CIA, created a clandestine intelligence agency, one that was not beholden to anyone, that was completely off the books, using these fired two to 300 agents. We know about this because it culminated in the uh, Iran-Contra scandal in 1986, eight years after the firing in which we discover that this clandestine, we discover the clandestine intelligence agency, and we discover that they're running drugs and guns, uh, mostly out of Mena, Arkansas. Uh, Bill Clinton was governor at the time. And, um, uh, uh, and that this, uh, um, uh, this clandestine organization, when Reagan got elected and Bush was his vice president, um, they, really hit the pedal to the metal and they got all the money and funding and the looking away that they wanted. And they uh, immediately cocaine began pouring into the United States. I was alive then. I remember very well what happened. Uh, uh, crime started skyrocketing. Um, people started going missing uh, all sorts of really weird stuff started going on. And, you know, as much as people want to praise Reagan, you know, he let it go on his watch. So, and it was a lot of bad stuff. And so, so just to clarify here, so there was this group of uh, individuals, really bad people within the CIA. They were yeah. then fired and then they organized this kind of black budget arm of the CIA and set up for guns and drug smuggling. Yep. And that's a really interesting part of this documentary too, because what they did is they pretty much just went out and set up on Indian uh, Native American that's right. land. That's right. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, that, that was kind of the brilliant part about this whole operation is that they could operate within the United States but not be inside the United States if they operated on Indian reservations, Native American reservations, because they're technically not part of the United States. That's why they can have gambling and all the other things that they have, because federal law doesn't uh, uh, have anything to do with them. They control and govern their own land. And so the CIA sent in this guy named, I can't remember his name right now. Uh, I believe they mentioned him in the documentary. And he he just has gobs of money. And he just comes in and you know gives it to the, all the cabazons. Uh, Native Americans and uh, they start a casino and and all sorts of all sorts of nasty stuff is going on on this Indian reservation um, and there's nothing that anyone can do about it because it's not United States uh, domain and that was the brilliant part and who knows how many other Native American reservations they took over because I mean they're rock bottom poor, right? They put them in the worst places, the worst land possible is where the reservations are, and so they're easy pickings. You come in with a bunch of money and you can you can take over really fast, and that's what these guys did. And so around um, 1987, Danny Casalero, who's a journalist, he reads an article in a, he was working for a computer magazine actually. And he reads an article about this promised software, right? And he decides to start looking into it. And he probably wishes that he hadn't. And um, he got involved in the investigation of it. And then he met Michael Riconosciuto. And, uh, and as he spread out his investigation, looking into these exact people, 
um, he began to call the whole thing the octopus because it was in everything. It was in every everywhere he looked. He found the tentacles of this group, this this clandestine ex CIA off the books uh, organization that may still be with us, by the way. And um, and so they've created. What they did was they they created human trafficking. They didn't create it. They increased and organized human trafficking, um, running of drugs back and forth, guns down to Central America if to go to El Salvador and Nicaragua and a lot of other places, and arming all of those people. MS-13 got armed by this. All of them did. And um, they uh, basically, they felt that, America, all of America, South and North America was theirs and that it was theirs to run. And so they became this, there used to be a bumper sticker back in the, uh, in the 1990s uh, on cars and it said, dare, that dare, op, you know, dare is dare to keep kids off drugs, right? It said dare, just like that. It said dare to keep the CIA from selling drugs. Right. And, and it was really true because that's what the, what the uh, that's what they were doing. Although they, it wasn't technically the CIA. So you can see how they got to do all the stuff that they wanted to do without having to have any responsibility for it by having this clandestine organization that Danny called the octopus. And. And who knows how many mysterious deaths and murders and and everything happened in the 90s and the uh, 80s that were a result of this group and what they were doing. And nobody talks about it. I mean, this, I guarantee you, we're the only show anywhere that's talking about this information because uh, nobody knows about it. This is like information you can only get from somebody from who's deep, deep into the intelligence world, which is where I got learned all this. Uh, had several, uh, what I used to do was I would uh, occasionally I would meet someone from the CIA and they would, you know, I'd say, can I talk to you? So I'm, I'm not telling you anything. I said, I'm not going to ask you to tell me anything. I don't want you to say one word to me. And they said, good, because they, they don't know if I'm CIA or not. I'm sure the CIA is always, con you know, contacting their own agents to find out what they're going to say, right? Uh, what they're going to cop out to, probably sending in beautiful women to do it, probably. Anyway, <laughs> that's um, a good MO. They do that all yeah. the time. Uh, Operation uh, Midnight Climax. So that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Short CIA running these brothels to get all this information out of politicians and people. Yeah, incredible. Exactly. And 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 um, and who knows how deep and far it goes? You know, that's the other thing is we just don't know. We don't know how how, um, what they're doing, where, where did this graduate to? You know, we don't know. And, um, I well, if you, if you kind of follow, because they kind of just brush over in the very first episode with this promise software and this gentleman that, oh yeah, that had a contract with the department of justice to create this, uh, software to track different cases, different court cases and different criminal cases to find the, the connecting tissue between all, all of the cases. And then the government, the department of justice ended up bankrupting his entire company and stole his software. And then that's when Michael Reconosciuto comes in. That's Michael right. Reconosciuto put the back door into the software and then the government sold that software to all the other different countries, intelligence communities. So they had that spy, they were able to spy on what any other country in the world was doing. That's right. And that's I think that, that way, that's the root of this. And I think that how it evolved, we've seen the evolving nature of it. We got it in our pocket. We got it in our hand. Now they no longer have to do that. Now it's just everyone's already got it. They already have the back door and the surveillance technology in everyone's pocket. Sure. And with that computer bank in, in Utah and you combine that with AI, they can watch everybody and cross index and everything in, in, re, in real time. I mean, uh, so, yeah, you're right. They don't even need the promise software anymore. It's useless because they can do it right now in real time with everybody. Uh, and so they can cross connect where I am and where somebody else is. And did we meet? Right. And it's like, how are you going to get away from it? They got, they're pinging your phone all the time. So they know everywhere you are. Um, there was a recent 
murder here in our area and uh, I was following it and uh, the, the, the cops had the guy um, running around his yard you know and, uh, and asking why why did you run around your yard for you know, 20 minutes you know clearly he was chasing something and you know his wife disappeared the next day and um, uh, you know and he said oh I was chasing chipmunks and I was like okay yeah right um, so yeah, that, that, when I saw that, I thought, oh my God, you know, I'm going to leave my phone at home, you know? So I do, I, I tend to just leave my phone at home if I can, because I now know they can track everybody and everything. But, but it's just interesting to see the, the origin of that. And I really think that that's what this documentary is really about. And they, they try, kind of try and just, you know, brush it off, but that's a huge deal that the United States did in the late eighties and, and into the early nineties. I mean, that means that they had a backdoor into whatever other countries intelligence communities was using the software for. And it's like, wow. I mean, that's a huge, it's like the infancy of the, the surveillance state. Yep. <laughs> it really was. And uh, uh, you know, and it was an amazing software. It really was. Bill Hamilton did a really good job developing it. And, uh, you know, suddenly, you know, you could have a um, you could have a, uh, a bank robbery in New York. And then three days later, you know, you have a very similar bank robbery in, say, Reno, Nevada. And in the old days, you would never even know the two happened or, you know, one might happen if you're in New York, but you wouldn't know about the Nevada one. Or if you're in Nevada, you'd know about that one, but about the New York one. And so the promise software immediately would, would you know, like that come up on the screen that, oh, my God, there was just a, a robbery with the same exact MO three days later. Right. And so now you have the software that's tracking these incidents so that you can manage your criminal uh, uh, management better. And it was brilliant and it probably saved a lot of money. But, yeah, the United States wrote Michael Rakanashuto wrote a back door into it and they sold it to everybody. Even Israel got it. So. Um, who is the power that did that? Well, it was the Department of Justice, but you know, you got to wonder who in the Department of Justice ordered that. I mean, that's like a, a really a, a very big criminal act, and uh, not to mention that they stole the software from Bill Hamilton and never paid him a dime. I mean, you know, anyway, the octopus may still be at, at, at large here. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I think that it was incorporated uh, finally into corporate organized crime is what I'm thinking that they by the by the time that Castellero was murdered, they were fully active. But I believe by the early 2000s, they had done what everybody else did, just created shell corporations and. Um, had everything funded in through that way. And they could, you know, because they, they just took everything corporate. So, you know, the um, that way they could never get caught and yeah. nothing could ever track back to them. That's right. And, and, and it's just skeletons back there anyway. So, you know, that the um, the CIA has uh, software and has had software since the early 1990s that tracks every single flight above 50 feet in the United States. They know where every flight is, where it's going, up to 50 feet above the ground. So they know where every single plane that has drugs is landing. They know where every single plane that has guns is landing. They know every all of it. They've known it for years. Uh, so, you know, you've got to take that into account. You know, what's going really going on here? And um, well, I think they did a sort of like a can't beat them, join them type of thing, because it really right. starts in the drugs really start in Florida with the with the cocaine. Yeah. And they found out the more that they would take down these drug cartel people, another one would just pop up so they couldn't stop it. And they're like, okay, well, how do, what do we do? Well, we'll just, we'll be the ones. We'll just <laughs> fold it in. Yeah. <laughs> we'll fold it into our company and take all the profits. Yeah. That's why the, the drugs get in. I mean, that's because it's all part of the, it's all part of the thing. That's why they're not stopping the fentanyl. Um, that's probably, uh, you know, who knows how much influence the octopus had on, say, the drug cartels, right? Because the octopus is moving literally tons of cocaine in and out of Colombia 
right? Moving it into Florida and Arkansas, right? So they, you know, they had to have known all the cartel leaders. I mean, how much influence? And I mean, didn't the cartels really not get strong until after Octopus was created in 1980? I mean, it's what it looks like. I don't remember any cartels before 1980. All of a sudden in the 1980s, there's cartels everywhere and they're armed to the teeth. Who's selling them the guns? You know, well, you know, it's the octopus. The, the octopus is the, the cartels are bureaucratic corporate offshoots of the original clandestine operation. And that's why they're not never stopped because you could easily stop these cartels. I mean, we know right where they are. You could go in there and drop a bomb on them or uh, do some psyops and make everybody have suddenly have a migraine inside their houses and stuff. We have all sorts of stuff that could do, but we don't do it. Uh, and, 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 you know, you have to ask yourself why. And I'm sure Danny Casolero was wondering why the cocaine <laughs> was flooding in. And he knew exactly where it was flooding in from. And he knew that this octopus was behind it all. And, um, you know, and then you have to ask yourself, you know, so when he died, um, the uh, police arrive and um, they take his body and the maid comes in. There's no crime scene at all. The maid comes in and cleans the entire motel room. After they take the body out, they don't come in and do any forensics. The maid cleans up the house. You don't tell me not to touch anything. They don't put the yellow tape over the door or anything. And then um, they, they cremate his body, you know? It's like, it's like, and, the, and the family didn't give permission for it. His brother plays an integral part in this documentary, and his brother's just like, oh, dude. And, and of course, it's super suspicious. And um, and we really don't know who Danny was going to meet. And, and another thing, if you are an investigative journalist and you're going to meet someone in the middle of the night, and two things, bring a friend and bring a gun. Because <laughs> you're going to be in, you don't know who you're meeting. You don't know what's going to happen to you. Well, I think he did ask one of his friends or maybe it was yeah. his brother to come with him to meet this person in Martinsburg, West Virginia, and they said no or that they couldn't or whatever. So I think he knew. It's just that I don't think anyone wanted to go with him. Yeah, well, that must have been a horrendous thing. So, you know, um, uh, in a lot of ways, it sent a chill through the entire uh, journalism community at the time. Um, and we were all terrified. Uh, I had a radio show and I was covering all sorts of super controversial stuff that no one was covering. And we were all, you know, it was a chill. It was a serious chill through the whole community. And um, I'm not sure we ever recovered, to be honest with you. The, the sense of freedom that we had before 1991 it never really came back except maybe in the early years of YouTube where they were freewheeling and letting us all talk and everything. But uh, it kind of kind of scared everybody so bad that everyone said, you know what, I'm just going to cover, you know, sports and entertainment or something because, you know, this is getting too dangerous. And I think we all knew that it was foul play. Even, even the um, normies had to have suspected that. This could not possibly have actually happened. And I know there was, oh, well, he was $200,000 in debt and all this. I know guys like Danny Castellero, they don't, they don't give a rat's ass about how much in debt they are. They're living, they're living their life and they don't care. And they don't. I know guys will just pay their credit card with credit cards with credit cards, and they're all crazy, and they're all doing what they want to do, and they're all highly intelligent. And Danny Castellero fits right into that bracket. So I don't think he killed himself at all. Don't even have a smidgen of a chance of it. Now, whenever I guess that kind of reminds me of uh, Pat Price as well. They did the, almost the exact same thing with Pat Price whenever he was found dead in California. He was a remote viewer for SRI International in 85, I believe, is when he was found dead in California. And they cremated his body without telling the family about it. 
I he took out a big life. life insurance policy before he died. He, the night before he died, he called all of his family members and told them cryptically that uh, goodbye. Yeah. You know, and a man with a briefcase came in and uh, took his body away in a suit and all that stuff. So it's a really strange coincidence. Now, whenever you talk to uh, Michael Reconosciuto, yeah, what did he did he give you any more information about Danny? Uh, did anything like that or in? Yeah, no, he was um, he was uh, one of those uh, really kind of um, super fast talkers. Uh, trying to cram as much, I think, because he was on a prison phone. I think it was a limited call. I can't exactly remember. It was three, three years ago. But uh, I think it was like we had a half hour, something like that. And that was all they were going to allow him to have. And so he was just like just tearing through it. And and I didn't have a tape recorder, so I was writing everything down as fast as I could. And, um, and, and he knew I had a radio show in Seattle. And so I think he was really trying, you know, to um, he wanted to uh, me to help him, basically, is what he wanted. And so I, I was, you know, firing off as many questions as possible. At first, I tested him to see if he really was a good programmer. And he was. I mean, he really knew how to do assembly. Assembly is the hardest. It's machine language. So it's seriously difficult, as anybody out there knows. They don't even think they do assembly anymore. But um, then after a while, he started saying stuff about, well, I was over at um, Wright Pat, I think he said, um, and they were asking me to write all this software for um, for their UFOs. And I'm like, bink! You know, I said, wait, 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 wait what? And then he, uh, he said, yeah, yeah, they're building uh, UFOs, flying saucers over at Wright Pat in Area 51. And and I, I, I go in there and I do operations for them. And, and I say, I've stopped him. I said, well, you know, you're saying UFOs. Are you are you saying like alien UFOs or these are aliens? And he goes, well, no, there probably are aliens, but these aren't, I don't think these are aliens. Like, this is our stuff. And so I went, ah, because I'd already been told a couple of years earlier in 89 by a, a, a high up at NASA, that they had craft and that they were all man-made and man-built and there were UFOs and most of the UFOs that people see are their craft. And they didn't say there, they said, we, the government has it. We now know it was a Navy program, but NASA was also run by the Navy. The Navy, get it? The Navy. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so the, yeah, the, and, 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 and so, uh, and so I really, I would say that the reason there has not been another Office of Naval Intelligence president until Trump. So all of Reagan, all of Bush two, no, Clinton, all of Clinton. So it's eight, eight, 16 years. And then Bush one, two, and that's eight years. So that's 24 years. Then Obama is eight years. So 32 years between Jimmy Carter and Donald Trump. Now, why do I think Donald Trump is an Office of Naval Intelligence candidate or a person? Well, first off, the CIA absolutely hates him. We know that. And we know that Obama ordered the CIA to disrupt his life in 2015 when he said he was going to run. But the real reason is because it's well-known fact that the guy who asked Trump to run in 2015 is former, maybe not former, Office of Naval Intelligence Officer Steve Bannon. And everybody around Steve Bannon, Jack Prasovic, and all those, they're all Office of Naval Intelligence, right? Since they're operating an insurrection. There's no doubt about it. The Office of Naval Intelligence is right now involved in an insurrection against the politicians backed by the CIA. That's what's going on in front of us. It seems like a war between two factions of people and they're kind of fighting for control based off of what yes. you're saying there. Now and they can never let Trump in because Trump will, uh, this time there's no way Trump will, uh, every rock will be overturned. Every, every file can, but will be opened. Everything will happen. Uh, there's no doubt about it. In fact, I would say from 
reading between the lines that um, Steve Bannon has created an army of people that are ready to go in there and do all of this. He's intimating that if you follow him. I don't really follow him that much, but people send me little snippets of what he says. And uh, he's the only one being open about the uh, Baltimore Bridge bombing, too. He's the only one that had Laura Logan on and said that it was definitely, you know, uh, a cyber attack. So, well, I mean, that's the reason why uh, he's not going to win the presidential election. There's no way. It's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. So, never anybody happened. that thinks that it is, is not. So, guaranteed it ain't going to happen. Uh, um, now, whenever it came to. Uh, the, because how you got to watch the entire documentary was when this lady came on and was talking about the Zabruder film, which I found this very suspicious. It was this lady right here, and it kind of came up out of nowhere. You know, this whole documentary is revolving around, uh, you know, Danny Castellaro, Michael Riconosciuto, the Christian... Kristen Hansen, the, the creator and the, the maker of the documentary, and they're going into all these murders. And then all of a sudden, randomly, we kind of, it seems like it's just inserted into the entire documentary. We get this lady that's talking about the Zabruder film. And she says that she saw a version of the Zabruder film that showed the driver of the limousine turning around and shooting JFK right. in the side of the head. Yeah. And uh, this was the real version yeah. of the Zabruder film. And the other version that everyone else got is a fake altered yeah. version. Yeah, that was kind of a mind blower because um, it was – clearly out of the blue, did not belong with the movie at all. And it's like a five minute diversion, which seems really odd. And furthermore, they kind of, so the pedigree of this whole thing is around that same time, around 1991, uh, researcher and writer, Bill Cooper, whom I knew um, was running around on the circuit, showing a version of the Zabruder film that was terrible. It was a copy of a copy of a copy. I saw it. I went to the lecture. I saw it. I talked to him afterwards. And we know the driver because we now in JFK X, we have the enhanced version, the best version ever, 4K version of the Zapruder film, which is the main reason you guys got to see it because nobody has that one. And we can clearly see that the driver has both of his hands on the wheel, but he does turn around and look at JFK before the thing that happens. And in fact, as soon as JFK does this movement, everybody except for Jackie is, has their head turned around and is looking right at JFK. So what I suspect is that the bad copy was the driver turning around and then a flash of light, uh, it, which is there, which would be about gun angle size. I think that's what um, you see, because here's the problem with that whole theory. First off, everybody would see it. Right. I mean, it'd be really loud. Right. Secondly, the driver is on the left. If we're looking at the car, the driver is on the left side and Kennedy's on the right side to hit Kennedy on the right side of the head. You couldn't do it from that angle. You could get him here on the other side there. You could get him, but you couldn't get this side of the head from over there. It's impossible. Just think about it. Reach around and try to imagine if there's somebody two car seats behind you. It's all the way over to the other side. How are you going to get your gun around to get him here? Which clearly is what happens. So it's a nice. And you, would, and you would also have to miss. Uh, oh, good point. <laughs> I didn't think of that part. You, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would have to miss. Um, what's his name? The, the Connolly and his wife. Connolly and his wife. Yeah, you yeah. would have to. Yeah, that would be, they would have to be perfectly positioned so they're not in the way, uh, which means they would probably have to be part of it. So, you know, that's it's an outlandish theory. The good copies don't show that. I take uh, um, variance with this idea that there's uh, several Zabruder films running around. I've never seen any. I've seen just the one. never seen any others. There's frame count. You can look at every frame and see where it's at. And, um, you know, and the, the other thing about the Zabruder film that I, I, I really think needs to be debunked is the idea that in 1963 that they had 
uh, uh, the motion picture uh, industry had technology that they could do things that they can do today. They they could they didn't. They, it was it was very difficult to make effects in those days. Everything had to be physical. You there there was airbrushing, but when you consider that the frame of sixteen millimeters about that big. You know, it's pretty hard to imagine how you would airbrush that. Now, I would say, that oh, you blew the frame up, you airbrushed it, and then you reduced it again. Okay, I guess that could happen. But that would be the only way it could go down in those days. Uh, you know, there wasn't, there was, it, it, Hollywood would be using every tool and invention that they could find to make movies. And so the, they, they didn't have it. I mean, they didn't. I know the technology, and I know they didn't have it. So did they uh, uh, do something to the film after the, after the splice at uh, frame 207? Yeah. Yeah. They put it through a, 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 a optical printer. printer. Yeah, thank you. An optical printer. And they made a traveling mat of the limousine with the people in it. And they mowed it, shrunk it down in size and lowered it and right when the shooting happens. And that's all. It was just a very simple way to hide what's going on and without it looking too, uh, unless you really know your optics, no one ever saw it. I mean, as far as I know, uh, four or five people have noticed that the people in the background are as big as or bigger than the people in the limousine, which cannot be by the law of physics. But not very many other people have noticed that. And so, again, this is all connected. It's so weird. And the fact that they stuck that in the film is just so weird because it just doesn't fit. And it's almost like they were told to put it in. That's what I, I'm wondering. Because well, even the lady's reaction to it, it's almost like it came out of left field. She was kind of like, oh, oh, and, and there's a Peter film. Yeah. You know? So it's like, it was, it was really strange. I, uh, it was a strange diversion for them to take in the middle of that uh, film. And it doesn't fit with anything. But it is an attempt to debug JFK, so, um, at the same time, you know, and 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 I'm, I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure that the intelligence agencies run Netflix, or at least the programming, and so I think they just said, well, oh, you had this footage here, why don't you just keep it in, you know, and we'll just keep it in because I mean, Netflix and Hulu seem to be the na the main uh, people that are trying to debunk JFK X. I mean. So I don't know. I'd have to look at um, at who owns uh, Hulu. Uh, Netflix. Disney. Disney. Yeah, Disney. So there you go. And we know who Disney is. And um, so there you go. Yeah. So, and, uh, you know, Disney was the uh, first, um, first film production to uh, um, uh, 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 broadcast uh, NASA before NASA was even created. Werner von Braun and Disney... Walt Disney got together and made a, a, a documentary that was shown on national TV. <laughs> it was incredible. And it had all fake footage in it of going up into outer space and, and, and everything. And, and, and then Werner later is working with Kubrick, you know, in the NASA East, which is London, which is where all the high ranking NASA, NASA people came to visit. And I heard this interesting theory that, um, maybe NASA wasn't visiting Kubrick on the set of 2001 for Kubrick to learn how to make the food, uh, fake the moon landing. Maybe NASA was trying to learn from Kubrick how to fake the moon landing. <laughs> <laughs> double, double. Got to hit him with a double, double. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, this, 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 the sad tale of the clandestine origins of this um, super intelligence agency, you know, goes back to this war between the CIA and the ONI. And that war created a third intelligence agency that we don't even know or anything about them, except for what we learned during the Iran Contra scandal, which was that they were running drugs and guns for money. And um, then it went completely obscure again. And you can't tell me that they just went out of business because Danny Castellaro is using their exact names in his book on the octopus. So he had the exact people that were involved. 
Uh, that oh, would... that's another thing that makes you wonder, like, and see that it's not a suicide because his briefcase, his documents, and everything that he was working on was missing oh. from his hotel room. Yep. Yeah, that's not <laughs> what a writer does. A writer doesn't get rid of all their stuff that they've been working on for 10 years and then kill themselves. It's just not how it goes. So, you know, it's pretty odd. Besides, he had what? nine slashes on one wrist and seven on the other uh, you lose your you lose your ability to move your hand and your arm once you cut that tendon there and uh, your arm will just flop down at that point you won't even be able to lift it or anything so even that should have been you know a, a cause for concern when they did the autopsy but they didn't do an autopsy they just burned the body cremated the body so um really suspicious and you know right outside of dc um where you know all the operatives are and um and uh yeah sad thing man really sad thing and rakana shudo he's now out of jail i don't know what he's doing maybe you should try to get an interview with him that would be cool well, it's interesting to the toward the end of the documentary, they're like, uh, you know, the filmmakers are kind of like, yeah, we're gonna wrap this up. We're kind of at a dead end and all this. And then Michael Reconosciuto calls them and is like, hey, uh, you know, this is what's going on. I'm getting ready to tell you the the actual truth of what's happening. What do you think that he was going to tell them. Do you think that he was going to tell them about the, the, the UFO stuff? I think, and, yeah. I think he was going to tell them about the fact that he was working in the secret space program back in the late eighties. And um, they, they, they probably, he probably did tell them and they just, you know, oh, I'm not going to touch that with a 10 foot pole. And, um, or they were ordered by whoever the guys are at Netflix to just stay away from that. And um, so they did. And so he was working, you know, on all these black op projects. And um, he was like the perfect guy because he was like a super genius and uh, super eccentric. You know, I, he liked to um, he liked his drugs and he liked his women. And, you know, that's the way it was. And uh, typical intelligence guy. <laughs> You you mean clandestine space operations, yeah. right? Yeah, because I mean, so in 1991, I mean, there was almost nobody talking about like a secret space program. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Hang on. Yeah, J J meant clandestine space operations, not uh, not what he just said. Uh, what did uh, I say? You said secret space program. I think you mean class, clandestine space. Yeah, yeah the clandestine space program, what we're calling SSP now, whatever it was. And, and, and again, you know, you go back to this octopus. It starts up in like 1980. Reagan's elected in 1980. Reagan is the number one guy behind the clandestine space operation. He writes about it in his diary. How they can, I was told today that we have a ship that can go into outer space and it can hold 200 people. That's what he says in his diary, right? And um, then we know Gary McKinnon hacked the Pentagon and found out that there was all these ships up there named after admirals, Navy, um, right? Old admirals, including the, the, the guy who was the first head of the CIA. And um, then he gets harassed for the next 10 years by the American intelligence agencies trying to get him uh, out of England and into the United States where he would for certain have roasted for the rest of his life in jail. And, um, and so we know that. And um, we know that they were active. And yes, they would be getting, you know, they're the top highest IQ people to work for them. A lot of the, uh, as David Politis, the missing 411 writer, he told me that a lot of the people that are missing that are never found are people with super high IQs. He said they just walk into the forest one day and then they're never seen again. And a lot of them are scientists. One guy um, was a, a top uh, physicist at University of Washington in Seattle. And um, he, um, he goes to the Olympic Forest, which is this really dense 
forest, amazing, absolutely amazing forest in Washington state. And he gets out of the parking lot and he's wearing, you know, in, in Olympic forest, it's like always 40 degrees and raining. He gets out of the car and he's wearing polka dot shirt, a shorts, a pink socks and blue shoes. And he says hi to every person in the parking lot. Hi, I'm going up that trail today and I'll be back tonight. And everybody's like, well, this weird guy, what's he doing? You know? And then he goes up the trail and he's never seen again. And, you know, you got to wonder if that guy wasn't making himself super conspicuous so that his absence would be uh, noticed. Right. And uh, and so uh, I think that a lot of this is what's going on. I think that I think that, you know, people like Jack Parsons, who supposedly blew up in his basement making chemicals. Um, I think he was probably taken into this clandestine program. Um, I think that a lot of, uh, of, uh, that kind of stuff is going on. Um, yeah, cause know. they can either fake your death or they can just make you missing. That's right. e either way it does the exact same thing. Now, what do you think, do you think that Bill Cooper, uh, was tossing around and showing people a, a fake version of the Zabruder film? Or do you think that he was showing a uh, just a really bad copy of the Zabruder film because Bill Cooper is responsible for a lot of nonsense that went around with from the community that tracks back to freaking Paul Benowitz uh, getting all this mis and disinformation from the NSA and uh, Air Force uh, special investigators. Uh, that's where Bill Cooper got the whole idea of contract with the extraterrestrials between Eisenhower. He got that from Paul Benowitz, which got Absolutely. it from NSA agents. Uh, Doty and um, and Bill Cooper told me that he said I was in the Navy and I was on watch uh, and I saw two UFOs fly out of the water right and he reported it and he, and 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 the, and the uh, uh, ONI took Bill down into a room and he fill, filled out his entire report and told him what he saw and then they pulled out a book he said a picture book and he said here look. Look at all the UFOs. And Bill's looking at him and he said, yeah, they're aliens um, and they're invading. And he said that they, they sat there and told him the whole story. And, and then he went out and, he, you know, they'd done clearly done a profile on him, a psychological profile, knew he was a blabbermouth, knew he would just tell everybody. And so they used him. He saw the UFO, so it was a perfect chance to use him. And, you know, they were probably Navy and the UFOs, I mean, and um, and so, the, you know, they took him out. And, and again, look at what uh, he's spreading. He's spreading that um, the driver shot Kennedy. Not that the Office of Naval Intelligence is helping Kennedy escape. No, 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 not that one. No, the driver somehow can whip his arm all the way around and, and shoot Kennedy with nobody seeing it and nobody hearing it and not hitting Johnson or Connolly and his wife. So, yeah, I think it was John, Bill Cooper was the Navy having fun, playing fun and games with him. And they do that all the time. And, uh, you know, it's not an accident that he came out of the Navy that the Navy told him that. By the way, on that same kind of subject, um, I'm going to forget the guy's name now. He's a Canadian. Can't remember his name now. Anyway, he is the very first guy to start pushing the modern version of the flat earth. He was a stand-up comedian after he came out as a flat earther. He was terrible. But he was a contract worker with NASA is how this all got started. And he was working down, I believe, in Texas, in Houston. And his story is, is that one day he got called into a meeting with these really top uh, people at NASA. And he was like, wow, these are like the top, the top people here. They want to meet with little old me. And uh, they laid out a map, which looked just like the UN uh, logo, he said, and said, this is the real shape of the earth. It's flat. And uh, it's a secret. We don't want anybody to know about it. And what did he do? He quit. Two weeks later, he's telling everybody on Earth, everywhere, that the Earth is flat. And he gets that other guy. I forget his name now, too. This is Eric 
Eric, I can't remember his name. He lives over in Thailand. Uh, he's now the, he told him then he started blabbing it all over. And you can see it all goes back to this one guy from Toronto who was given all the information by NASA, he says. Well, it's so, a deception operation. That's what they did to Paul Benowitz as well. They gave him, they told him to keep quiet about all this information. Don't tell anybody. And of course, right. what's the first thing that somebody's going to do whenever they get this explosive, <laughs> wild information? They go out and tell everybody about it. Everybody. And then that gets the mythology a rolling. I mean, whenever you track back almost all of the extraterrestrial stuff, you can see that it came from Paul Benowitz. Paul Benowitz and Bill Cooper. Yep. That's who it came from. And they were both influenced by a, Benowitz, by Air Force intelligence, and by uh, Bill Cooper with naval intelligence. And who's running the uh, clandestine saucer program? Probably the Navy and the Air Force, I would imagine. <laughs> right? <Yep. laughs> so that's how it is. And, um, uh, 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 you know, um, just as an aside, I think I'm going to tell this story just because it's never been told. I once had a friend who was super high up in Scientology. He was a banker and he would, he loved my movies and he would give me money. He had tons of money. He would give me money to help me finance my movies. And um, he was really into conspiracy and everything. And um, uh, he said, I, I was talking to him one time. And we're talking about L. Ron Hubbard, who was Office of Naval Intelligence. And I was saying, well, Scientology was started by, you know, Office of Naval Intelligence officer, L. Ron Hubbard. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, well, you, you know the origins of Scientology and the, and the E-meter? The E-meter is the thing that reads your mind. You put your hands on these cans and say, how much money did you make last year? You say, yeah. 30,000, it goes bing, 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 and you go, okay, 45,000, right? And, uh, you know, because it knows when you're lying. It's just a lie detector. Anyway, um, he told me that after World War II, that the Navy had had such a um, problem with homosexuality uh, during World War II on the Navy boats that they signed Elrond to find a way to cure people of homosexuality. I'm like, what? And, uh, and he said, so he invented the E-meter. He probably didn't invent it, but, you know, he says he did. And um, and then when we have recruits come, we say, you know, do you like women? You know, and we find out whether they're gay or not. And I said, um, well, I mean, did it work? He said, no. <laughs> he said, it didn't work. He said, they could still get by. And I, I went, oh, okay. And he said, but then Elrond took it, you know, public with Scientology. Uh, and and it's, and it's a. Uh, I said, you know, to me. Scientology looks like a giant intelligence gathering operation. And he said, it is. That's what it is. And this guy was in the Navy, by the way. And um, and so, you know, just think of what a perfect intelligence gathering operation that is. Every week, you know, you're paying $2,000 a month to come in every week and take your little course. Is it see anything unusual this week? Right? And you go, oh, no. Bing, bing. Yeah, you did. What did you see? Yeah, and I'm pretty sure you're telling them about something that you saw. And it's all getting written down, collated into a computer system. And uh, and that's why you never go to Scientology. You stay as far away from them as you can. But uh, that's also... So, so they invented a gaydar? That's pretty much what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> Yes. Hey, look, I, I have absolutely no problem with gay people. They can, I don't either. They can do whatever yep. they want. Uh, there's actually and some including of Including join the Navy. Yeah. They yep. can, whatever they want to do, they can do. I got no problem with them. Some of the gay people that I've met are some of the nicest people that, you know, that I've ever met. So the most talented, smart, smartest people I've ever known are gay. So, and, and, and those are the things that I value in people is intelligence and creativity. So, um, yeah, it has nothing to do with that. I just thought it was interesting that the Navy was so interested in, in, in rooting it out at the end of World War II that they invented this whole entire psychological program, which interesting that it didn't work, you know, because I know it didn't work because I know guys that were in the Navy that were gay. So they obviously it didn't work. So I wonder, it makes me wonder if Scientology even works or it's just an intelligence gathering operation. 
Well, you got a lot of connections between Scientology and uh, the, the three-letter organizations. A lot of people that were a part of the remote viewing Stargate project were uh, supposed Scientologists. Hal Putoff is a known Scientologist. Uh, Miss North here says, so a high level Scientologist was funding your projects. Jay, yeah. when did you, yeah. when did, did you know from the beginning that he was a high level Scientologist? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I knew he was, he was a high level Scientologist. He was really into alchemy. That's how we met. And so, you know, we had a bunch of talks about alchemy and then I said, I really need money to, to uh, go travel, to look up all this stuff. And he set, wrote me a check for $25,000 right on the spot. And I was able to, you know, go tr travel to France and Peru and Italy. And uh, I'm sure that they were watching me. I mean, I was followed everywhere I went in France. I, I saw the same people. Like, I was all over France for uh, two and a half months. And I kept seeing the same people. They were in the restaurant across from me. Then I'd see them in another city, you know, following me down the street or in a car driving by. And, yeah, you know, the... Um, for some reason, uh, alchemy attracts uh, the intelligence world. I'm not sure why. Well, that's it, how Scientology works, right? Is, don't they like kind of stalk you a little yeah. bit and figure out everything about you and then that's try right. and bring you in for an initiation? Yep. Isn't that yeah. the way it works? Yeah. And, you know, and, and guess what he wanted me to do on my travels? Every, every two weeks, I had to file a report and, and mail it to him. So there you go. So you, I, mean, I knew they were watching me. Um, I, I didn't care because I, I didn't have any money and I wanted to do this research. I had a lot of little bit of Danny Castellaro in me too, where money is the least important thing that I'm worried about, I'm more interested in the work I'm doing. And that's why I know that Danny's the real deal. And uh, yeah, so I did have high level Scientology looking into me. I've been told that, you know, that I've had every, every major agency has gigantic files on. That's what I've been told by someone whom I'm close to in the FBI. Someone I went to school with told me that I have uh, a gigantic file on, on at the FBI on me. What can I do? You know, I didn't mean to set out to go do that, but uh, I'm just interested in the same kind of subjects that would get me to have a file. You know, I want to know what's really going on, and I'm and I'm, I'm kind of relentless at it, and uh, so I'm you know I'm raising alarms probably all the time. Right now, the uh, um, Biden administration is asking Google to send anyone who's viewed whatever these sites are that they gave them a list of uh, send their IDs to to the feds. Right now, that happened what yesterday. So, you know, I don't know how many sites I visited that are on that list. I probably almost all of them. And uh, so, you know, I'm moving up to another list now and, uh, you know, it'll just keep growing. And um, at the same time, they watch people like us because we gather information and that's what they're doing. They're intelligence agents and they're gathering information. And so if by watching us, their intelligence gathering, they're just using us as their as their uh, workhorses, right? Well, they're not going to find nothing uh, on any of my computers or my phones. I do it all from the head, baby, and that's how it goes. I don't have anything on my computer either. <laughs> no way, man. I'll put anything on my computer. <laughs> I keep a notebook. <laughs> uh, exa yeah, that's exactly right. You don't ever save any of your passwords to no any of your way. devices ever. Never. No way. I never... If I even get remotely close to a porn site, I start turning off my computer. That's another thing, too, though. They track you through those um, those porn yeah, sites. They do. Never go to a porn site. Never. And if one accidentally gets on your computer, get it off as fast as you can because they're timing it. They're timing it. If you can say, well, I saw it and I got it off in one second, right? But if you let it linger, you're going to get a visit. I guarantee it, especially if it's a certain kind of porn. So... Uh, they can take you down, but you got to be careful. And I, I, I'm not, I do not fish around on the internet. I never go to the dark web or anything like that. I know they're watching it. And I know as soon as I do it, they'll be coming for me. So. Yep. Hacking into your stuff like that. Um, and that's relating to this uh, documentary as well. But there's another 
documentary that I wanted to bring up with you before uh, we wrap up this evening, because I think that it's also very important to discuss, and that is the program Cons, Cults, and Kidnapping. And I believe I've talked about it a few times on my show before, and this really shocked me. Yeah, this me one too. really shocked me being on Netflix. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, wow, this is exactly what all these secret space program, all these super soldiers talk about. It's the yeah. it's verbatim the exact same thing, them being abducted in the middle of the night by uh, men. They're put into an SUV. They're taken, uh, to, taken somewhere. They're MK Ultra, And then yeah. they're sent back to their parents. That's yep. exactly what happens in this documentary. This is the sure. exact same thing, but it's a facility. It's a behavioral health. Yep, it's an so, MKL operation. Yep, and um, and so I mean, it was you that brought it up, and it's a brilliant idea. Is I mean, yeah, in the documentary, they go to that one school in I think New York, but how many other schools are there? How many are how, there? Could be hundreds of these schools where they're taking kids. And by the way, every person that I ever talked to that was in the secret space program told me that they were a, a, a bad kids. They were troubled kids. Every one of them, everyone said it. So they would be exactly what they would do in this program because that's who these kids are. They were troubled kids. The parents didn't know what to do with them. This company comes to them and says, oh, we'll, we'll make your kids better again. Just sign this document and give us a lot of money. Oh, by the way, we're going to be over about 2.30 in the morning. We're going to be all dressed in black. And we're going to take your kid from him, and you're not going to see him for a year or two. And we're going to put him in a MK Ultra boot camp program. But as you pointed out, Ryder, why couldn't they have cover programs in some of these schools that we don't know about? where they actually make them all think they are in a secret space program. <laughs> yeah. You're so special. And, and we took you into the secret space program and, and you're going to become a secret space warrior astronaut. And, and, you know, and I mean, what a great way to straighten out a, a, a defective kid, right? To make them think that they're part of a big program. And they're going to be an astronaut and okay, well, I'm going to start getting good grades and I'm going to start being, good in school because I want, I want to succeed in this. And then they, you can, we know that they can feed them false memories so they can feed them false memories or even false recreations. I mean, we don't know how far these programs have really gone. They're, they're illegal, I believe. And I believe that we need to um, uh, on a state by state basis, find out we are all the programs in our States and root them out because um, this is a really dangerous thing to be doing. This is, um, and it's cultural conditioning yeah. as well. You know, like yeah. uh, a lot of these kids suffered a lot of trauma within sure. behavioral health programs, and that affects them for their entire life. Yeah. You know, like they were beaten, they were tortured, basically. And oh, my God, really, a very interesting part about it that immediately got me got my attention it was in the very first episode when because we're uh me and jay are currently working on a uh, new documentary and uh it has to do with mk ultra and uh, the film industry yep. and uh they said in the beginning of this documentary that they would use stanley kubrick's 2000 the opening of stanley kubrick's 2001 a space odyssey they would put that on repeat over and over and over again. That, that's a psychic driving yep. technique. That is a MK Ultra technique and the phrases that they would be meant to repeat. And another wild part of this too, Jay, is that they also had the parents just as MK Ultra and brainwashed as that they had the kids. Or more. I mean, they, those parents were just like blind to what was going on and, uh, and following along with it. I mean, it was insane. They knew that it was a lie, but they were still following along with it. It's just like uh, it's like that program at Stanford where they, you know, took those guys and turned them into uh, into robots, kind of. I think that that's what this what was going on here. They were like, uh, um, it it was it was a, clearly a CIA operation. I'm sorry, the whole thing was, and I, I mean, I'm sorry, but it was. The way that they were hiding shell shell companies within shell companies, that's exactly how they do it uh, all the time. So I yeah, highly recommend the program. 
on Netflix. I can't believe that, that you did it, Netflix. I really want to thank you for that because it does give us a whole different version or idea behind the messing of the minds causing people to think that they were in some exalted program when they weren't, when they were actually captured by a criminal company that was mind controlling them. That's exactly right. And it's very easy to mistake one of these um, behavioral modification programs yeah. as a special uh, SSP program. I will and even posit this, that let's say there's, 30 of these schools, right? In on schools, pro uh, jails, really, in, in America. So let's just pick a number out arbitrarily, say 30. Each one is each one of them is devoted to a different style of MK Ultra program as an experiment, right? That's what you would do. So some would think they were in the secret space program, some would think they're taken by aliens, some would think that they were in a you know, all sorts of different ways that you could uh, put this out. And all you would have as a result is a bunch of traumatized, messed up minds running around, telling stories, confusing everything, confusing everybody, doing exactly what the CIA director, William Casey, said. By the time we get done here, everybody, everything that everybody knows will be confusion. That is the purpose of the program. Okay. And it kind of goes into what Yuri Bezmanov was talking about too, the uh, the KGB defector in the yep. 80s, I believe, you know, was talking about how the, the, the ways to subvert an entire country, you know, you, you first take over the children, Yep. Right? you brainwash the children, and then in a couple of generations, the, the work will be done for you. That's right. And it's being done right now. The children are so far gone that apparently a generation alpha um, can't even read. They're having trouble teaching them how to read. The kids that are like seven or eight years old right now, uh, uh, be, uh, probably because of the COVID MK Ultra operation. And, um, and so, you know, we're raising a generation now that may not be able to function at all in society. There's another documentary that uh, came out earlier that was called a uh, hell camp in the teen nightmare. That was basically the, it's kind of the infancy of these teen behavioral modification schools and these, uh, these, uh, you know, boarding schools or whatever you want to call them. And it started in the seventies at this, um, in Utah, but the, the basis for it was the exact same thing. Like kids are being abducted in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., uh, to, thrown into a, uh, an SUV. They're taken to Utah to go out in the desert and, and hike for uh, 60 days. Yep. Yeah, it's it's brutal. And uh, they uh, it is – we have to make it illegal. We can't allow this to go on. Um, it's really going to mess up society. But, I mean, it is brilliant that you extrapolated the secret space program uh, storytellers uh, with this idea of the program. And I got to tell you, that is that could be a documentary, actually. Well, I mean, it's it's even the same thing. It's even called the program. And what are these secret space program people call it as well? They call it the programs. The program. That's right. And that's what it is. And, and how do I, and, and, and it seems like the people that are involved in it, they'll be like, oh, well, I know you from somewhere. You're very familiar. And it's to, right. rope, it's to rope them in to the, to the entire thing. And they talk about in this documentary that uh, it was very difficult for them to keep track of each other. That's right. You know, that. that it, it was hard to find each other because they basically cut off communication between them. So you would have to remember all the people's full names to be able to look them up later. And that's yep. what all the secret space program people, oh, I know you from somewhere. It's got to yep. be yep. from the programs. Well, you're not talking about the secret space program. You're talking about behavioral modification programs is what that's you're right. talking about. That's right. Disguised as a secret space program disguise as alien abduction, disguise as all this other stuff. Who knows what they're really doing in these places? For sure, the uh, 
you know, they're all experiments. That's the one thing we can all agree on. They're all experiments. Every kid was an experiment. The whole thing was an experiment. Everything was an experiment. Each kid had different stuff tried on them to see what effect it would have later. And they're probably following and tracking those kids still to this day. Probably. And then the, the parents, too, it was so, so weird and interesting. It was like very ritualistic things that they were doing on these parents. Like they were making them do like weird uh, meditations. They were being like blindfolded. Yeah. They were all like holding hands, walking around in a circle and stuff. making them cross dress and like all this weird stuff. Yeah, like, what, what is this? Is that? I don't get that. They're making the parents cross dress. I just don't know about that. That's really strange. It is really weird. And uh, I had Kathy O'Brien on the other day, and she was yeah. talking about how, you know, there's this extraterrestrial and alien MK Ultra program that's being ran on people to make them believe that it's extraterrestrials. And they're using these extraterrestrials as scapegoats in order to cover up uh, what – the, the the government is doing and humans are doing to other humans. Yep, that's right. So they'll give us give them a holographic image of an extraterrestrial or a reptilian or whatever, and then people that see that think that it's real, and then they go out and spread that information when it's not real, so that they it's covered up with uh, you know the the government involvement. Yeah, yeah. Also on that same thing, I want to finish with this. Annie Jacobson was on Lex Friedman, I think. The other day, she's a really, really good journalist, and he asked her about Roswell, and she said that Roswell was Stalin flying a remote control air uh, uh, flying device over New Mexico with um, surgically deformed humans aboard to scare Americans into thinking that there was an alien invasion. That's what she said. This is the woman who wrote the, the book on Area 51. Right. And she's the insider insider. Right. And that's what she said Roswell was. Think about that. And that's exactly why people tended to believe in the late 40s and into the 50s and into the 60s. They were like, oh, it's an alien invasion. All these weird and strange craft. The, the flying saucers right. are all coming down from Earth. I mean, yeah, sure. Yeah. And she said that Stalin got the idea from the War of the Worlds broadcast by Orson Welles. That's where the idea from for this came from. And she was told this by a super high intelligence agent. That's her source for almost everything that she has. Uh, she didn't say his name, but it's somebody high up who told her all of this stuff. That's where she, all of her books are from this one guy who just tells her everything, right? Well, I mean, it's the perfect, uh, it's the perfect cover up and it's the, it's the perfect story. You know, the, you can just shuffle the blame on the, something that no one ever sees. No one can prove that exists. It. You can't argue with it. You can't do anything about it. So it's a perfect uh, cover story. It is. It's unbelievable. Well, Jay, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Amazing conversation. Uh, can you let people know? Uh, yeah, give them the, the information and where they can watch JFKX and uh, the, yep. the website and uh, your YouTube information as well. Yep, I got a show on YouTube named Reality Check. Just type in Reality Check, Jay Widener. They'll show up. Uh, JayWidener.com is where all my free writing is. My movies are all up on Gaia, except for JFKX, which is on Amazon Prime. And uh, everybody get ready for the next movie because the next one's going to blow you away. It is going to be incredible, and we're currently working on that one right now, and then people are really going to love it. It's going to take a little while because it's going to be uh, yeah. really incredibly produced. So, uh, yes, it think, is. Uh, check out JFKX on Amazon Prime. Also, if you're outside of the United States, uh, you can ch check it out on Vimeo.com as well internationally. And uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. really appreciate your time this evening. Please be sure to hit the thumbs up button to help the channel and the algorithm. Share, subscribe, hit the bell icon as well for notifications. And Chloe, thank you very much for becoming a Writer Ranger member. really appreciate a new Writer Ranger channel member video will be dropping tomorrow. So become a Writer Ranger channel member to check out that episode. All right, see you guys next time.